wanted to say that uh, I'm really honored to have you, Colonel Conway B. Jones, Jr., um, to interview because I think you're a hidden gem. And I don't know, I only discovered you really two months ago. Um, and since then, I thought to myself, this is somebody who needs to be known. Your story needs to be known. And uh, you're a fascinating, unique individual and a local treasure. So uh, I want to thank you for taking time thank you. to talk to us. Um, so first, I would really love to know, and I did a little research. I hope you're OK if, if I poke around in your backstory. That's fine. Um, and so I was curious about your parents and your upgrading, upbringing and where you grew up and how that influenced you uh, in your early life. I was born in Washington, D.C. in 1939 and was raised for the most part in my family home there in Adams Point. Uh, Adams Point and Washington, D.C. being segregated at that time, so there were two separate communities. The white community was downtown F Street and G Street that included Capitol Hill and the Smithsonian, and then there was Adams Point. Uh, U Street, uh, the famous theaters and nightclubs and uh, This was the 1940s? In the early 1940s, yes. Okay. And the many black churches. Uh, my family church was a metropolitan AME church. Uh, my family helped build that church, and uh, it uh, received uh, a lot of notoriety the day of the presidential inauguration when William Jefferson Clinton came to worship at Metropolitan Church before he was uh, sworn in as President of the United States. So that was Washington, D.C., a colored community, uh, colored schools. Uh, I went to Dunbar High School on Adams Point, uh, Francis Junior High in Georgetown, and then the Old Dunbar, mm -hmm. which is the home of uh, many prominent citizens. And it was interesting in Washington, D.C., because the schools were uh, constructed so that there was a school, a high school in particular, for every category of, of, of talent. Dunbar was the uh, college preparatory school. We had uh, Cardoza, which was a business uh, school, uh, Mary Margaret Washington, which was a school for home economics. Armstrong, which is a school uh, for primarily the trades, and then Spingarn. And uh, when we were together uh, a few weeks ago, my friend of uh, 70 years, Fred Jordan, who's the president of the uh, San Francisco African American Chamber of Commerce, was in Spingarn at the same time I was at Dunbar. So we've known each other for over seven decades and uh, started wow. Howard University together. Wow. Yes. And, and doesn't Dunbar have a focus on the arts, the performing arts? And I, yes. I know a number of uh, music and writers that, that went to Dunbar. That's true, yes. Okay. Uh, but it was primarily a college pr uh, prep college school. Prep. Yeah. But then there was another uh, institution also that was a trade uh, school. So in the colored community in Washington, D.C., uh, you could attend a school that uh, taught five trades, uh, plumbing, uh, electrical, uh, woodworking, uh, sheet metal, uh, auto mechanics, and bricklaying. Hmm. So if you finished that school, you had a trade, you, you could operate out of the trunk of your car if you were fortunate to buy a truck. Mm -hmm. That was your family income for your, 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 your lifetime. You trade off services. You the, carpenter would trade services and the, the painter would trade services like that. Mm -hmm. So it was always gainful employment in the black community yes. and meaningful gainful employment. Absolutely. We need more of that. And what did your parents do for a living? My father was uh, in the United States Army Infantry and served infantry uh, in both World War II and Korea, Purple Hearts in both. And my mother was a, a government worker. She started a GS-5 and ended the GS-5. But uh, we owned our own homes. and. Uh, it was just a very nice experience, a very positive experience. Uh, family uh, defined uh, where we grew up and how we grew up, and family values. Mm -hmm. Did you have uh, siblings, brothers and sisters? No, just, yeah. uh, just yeah. a little child, yes. Okay, yes. okay. So all the focus was on you, huh? I guess so, yes. Uh, okay, all right. And your father was in the military. Yes. So, okay, uh, that could have been an early influence. So what did you do after high school? Uh, I went to Howard, started Howard. Okay. And, uh, Went what there did you and, uh, study there? I started uh, engineering and then engineering. Uh, transitioned to uh, liberal arts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, went to New York after that. Uh, I didn't graduate from Howard at the time. I went to New York and uh, spent uh, 
four years in New York City. I won't ask you what you were doing that you didn't graduate, but okay. But you went to New yeah. York, and so you were working uh, You were working in New York? Yes, and going to school there. I uh, went to Long Island University, CW Post College in, oh. in Long Island, and uh, yes. I was going to graduate from there with a bachelor's degree, and then uh, started the military. Okay, okay. So, oh, so you were planning to go into the military, or that just, that just, just happened, it just yeah, happened? Yes. Okay. Somewhere along the way. Somewhere along yes. the way, okay. And you went into the Air Force? Yes. Okay, so I understand this is coming forward a little bit, but mm -hmm. I understand that you had 64 combat missions? You flew? 87 airless 80, missions. 87, 87. missions, yes. Mm -hmm. And that was during what years? Uh, so 1963 to the height of the war, uh, 1970. We, we continued on uh, till the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Vietnam. It was around 70, 75, yes, huh? yes. Yes, interesting. I, that's, that's pretty remarkable. So I just, first of all, I just want to say thank you for your service uh, and thank you for representing uh, uh, our people. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an interesting time, and uh, we fast forward now. We have uh, in the Pentagon, we have uh, General Charles C.Q. Brown, who's the Air Force Chief of Staff, who happens to be black, and uh, Lloyd Austin, who happens to be black, uh, who's the Secretary of Defense. Right. And there's just a Navy captain, uh, Captain Day, who just took over the management of uh, uh, Norfolk. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Norfolk, yeah. we did have a naval base in, in Norfolk, so yes. it's time. Excellent, excellent. So when did you move out to the Bay Area, to Northern California? I came here in April of 1963, uh, reported to Travis Air Force Base, and oh, uh, I, I stayed there for 30 years, uh, eight active duty, and 22 of the Air Force Reserve. Okay, okay, excellent. So uh, so you retired from Air Force Reserve yes. then, and you have still responsibilities as a retired um, uh, Air Force Reserve? Yes. Uh, I'm a liaison with the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. In that capacity, we uh, locate uh, and help groom and recruit uh, candidates that attend the Air Force Academy, but uh, that extends out to encompass all the military academies, uh, West Point for the Army, Annapolis for the Naval Academy, and the Coast Guard Academy. Oh, right. Okay. Yes, so, yeah. Excellent. So with regard to that, each congressperson has 20 nominations. Uh, five at each of the four service academies, and the senators have 20 nominations, as do the vice president, and the president have 100 nominations to attend the Air Force Academies, and the scholarships are around $300,000. Okay, wow, that sounds good. Um, look, so I wanna pivot to, because we're here at the Aviation Museum in Oakland, and I understand you're a founder of the yes. Aviation Museum, so tell us a little bit about the, the space we're in and how you came to be a founder. The concept of the museum started with uh, the late Ronald Ruther, an uh, aviation enthusiast, and he recruited me early on uh, to join him in this journey. And we searched uh, over the years trying to find a home in the Bay Area. We looked at the uh, uh, properties in Marin County and in San Francisco and in Oakland. And as it turned out, uh, the late Jack Daly, uh, owner of World Airways, uh, befriended me, and he offered us the opportunity to start a museum in Hangar 5 at World Airways, which is just down the street from us now. So Hangar 5 World Airways, uh, Mr. Daly, was the first home of the then Western Aerospace Museum. So in that room, we had our first exhibit, a BD-5 uh, aircraft, which was a kit about the size of uh, maybe eight or nine or 10 feet long. Mm -hmm. That was our first home and our first exhibit. And we fast forward, uh, we'd known uh, Chuck Foster, who was then the director of aviation for the Port of Oakland, and uh, Mr. Foster, a retired Navy captain. So I met with Mr. Foster over lunch at Scott's, and, uh, asked for this building, uh, Hangar L621. And this is why we were standing waiting to be seated uh, at the, at the, uh, at the uh, wait stand. And uh, so he said, we could have L621 in the hangar. And I said, well, we'd like it for a dollar a year. He said, that's fine. And I said, I'd like you to waive the dollar. 
So it was fine. So it was all before we were seated. So I said, well, Chuck, so, we finished now. So thank you very much. I said, well, what about lunch? Said, well, yes, I said, lunch is fine, but it has to be on you. I finished my lunch with you. Right. So You're good. I'll never negotiate against I, you. I said, I have to give uh, all thanks to uh, uh, Navy Captain Retired uh, Charles Foster for making this possible. Uh, he went on to become uh, Executive Director of the Board of Oakland. Mm -hmm. He still he lives here in, in Hercules, but uh, still okay. a good friend of aviation. Right. And when did this space open uh, to the public? I think it's been uh, 1985. 1985. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're all you're almost at uh, 40 years. Now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent! That would be a big uh, big celebration yes. then. And uh, we we're pleased. Uh, you'll see a little later. Our first exhibit in this room was a tribute to the Tuskegee Airmen, mm -hmm. the 20,000 uh, colored to entered uh, aviation, the Army Air Corps, in Tuskegee, Alabama, Moulton Field, actually, and uh, almost a thousand became pilots. They uh, noted the Tuskegee Airmen Red Tails, who were known, yes. and uh, we're down to, as I said, last three now that are still alive, uh, but still yes. a very strong presence. So you'll see the room is dedicated to them. Uh, Benjamin O. Davis led the organization. Uh, General Davis, a West Point graduate, yes. 1936. In his four-year tenure at the school, never spoken to by his classmates, who were silenced. Promoted uh, to the rank of four-star general by mm -hmm. President Bill Clinton in, in 1996, I guess. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. A lot of history. So those were your, they were during the World War, World War II, the yes. Tuskegee Airmen, so you, they preceded you. Um, and you're carrying it forward. Now, were you gonna, you're going to show us around yes. a little later on, yes. so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so I want to pivot a little bit from your your um, aviation career uh, into some of the many other things that you've done because you're kind of a, a renaissance man, I mm -hmm. guess that's one way to, to say it. Um, and you founded a number of other organizations and you're a patron uh, of the arts, so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, so. You know, for example, you are uh, uh, you are founding chairman of the Clara Barton House and yes. Gardens, and tell me about that organization. All right, Clara Barton was the angel on the battlefields of the Civil War. Yes, she founded the American Red Cross in 1881, mm -hmm. and then came to Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in 1899, following the flood that uh, claimed 2,209 lives. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of serving on the board of directors in Johnstown for the, over the last two decades, uh, Concurrent Technologies Corporation, a defense contractor, was uh, chairman of the CTC Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced to the Clara Barton House in Johnstown. It was uh, unoccupied and about to be torn down. So I put together uh, what's now a nonprofit, the Clara Barton House and Gardens Incorporated. We bought the house from the city of Johnstown and in the process of restoring that. So hopefully that will come back to life uh, pretty soon. I'll be going back to Johnstown uh, at the end of May. Really? Uh, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Johnstown Flood Museum. Oh. And that's a museum established in Johnstown to celebrate the catastrophic flood that claimed those 2,200 plus lives, 2,209 lives, and just did massive destruction. So we're hoping to have that celebration the 31st of May this year. 31st of May. Yes. What year was that, that flood? 1889. 1889, yes. okay. Wow, okay. So um, a lot of history there. Yes. It's amazing. Uh, uh, you know, your living history, which is, is beautiful. So you mentioned that you're on the, on the board. Are you still on the board of Concurrent Technologies? I left the board the uh, year before last and left as chairman of the foundation last year. Okay. But I served on both for over 20 years. For 20 years, yeah. okay. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit now. You founded or were co-founder for an organization called Right to Path Learning. Uh, tell right me about Path that. Right to Path Learning. Uh, Steve Edrick and I founded this uh, nonprofit, uh, I think, three years ago, answering the call of uh, <clears throat> the fact that in Oakland, our youth were falling behind in reading skills. Mm -hmm. So prior to the pandemic, it was reported that 40% of the young black men in Oakland were high school dropouts. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic exacerbated that situation. I think now we have uh, first graders and some second graders, and perhaps even one or two third graders, that are reading at the kindergarten level. 
So Right Path to Learning has, uh, over the last three years, taken between 15 and 28 uh, third graders and put them in, uh, in a program and provided them 50 hours of uh, tutoring. And through that time, we've been able to raise their uh, reading levels uh, up a half a year, sometimes three quarters of a year. So we feel very proud about that. I think mm -hmm. the most we had was uh, 29 students uh, doing one of our sessions. Okay. And I think we have uh, 18 students that are currently uh, okay. third okay. graders that are in the program now. They'll get 50 hours of uh, intensive uh, tutoring mm -hmm. and learning how to read and reading appreciation. And uh, we're hoping to. Uh, set an example of what can be done uh, with private sector as support in, in helping to uplift the circumstance for our young people. And is that based in uh, the East Bay, right, to Yes. yes. Is Oakland, there any yes. plan to expand, um, uh, or you're going to stay within Oakland? We're, we're going to stay within Oakland. Uh, there's some um, turmoil, and it's, that may be too strong a word, but within the Oakland Unified School District. Yes, uh, so right. Yes. We're hoping to weather that and continue our efforts to to set an example. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a biblical phrase: "As you do for the least of mine, you do for me." Yes. So yes. as you do for the least of mine, you do for me. So we're trying to do through our good deeds the least of ours in Oakland. Absolutely, and that's a huge issue around the gap, the literacy gap, and the learning gap, uh, performance gap uh, by ethnicity. So thank you for. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing that work. So I'm going to ask you a little bit now about um, a subject that seems to be near and dear to our hearts, which is your relationship with the Post News Group. Mm -hmm. And this is the San Francisco Post edition mm -hmm. uh, from the last week of February, first week of March. And there's somebody on the cover who looks familiar. I'm here with uh, Mayor Willie Brown and with the Consul General of China. And we're at the uh, Lunar New Year celebration that took place at the Chinese uh, consulate on February 28th this year, and I was um, Conway's guest, much to my surprise. So he had me in the photo ops, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> and this apparently has all kinds of plans. But tell me about your history with this from when right. uh, you were involved when Thomas Berkeley gotcha. was, was running this. So the Post was founded by the late Thomas Berkeley, mm -hmm. a UCLA graduate and track star, and a former port commissioner. A very rich history. I uh, was talking about some of his dimension. Uh, Mr. Berkeley went to China and was actually instrumental in exporting the cranes that we see along the uh, estuary uh, at the Port of Oakland. He was initially responsible for, bring, for purchasing those cranes and bringing them back on barges to the Port of Oakland. Mm -hmm. So he was instrumental in, in opening that door to China. First time in, in the 5,000 year history that China had exported anything of that dimension to this country. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the post, Mr. Berkeley founded that, and there were nine mastheads uh, circulated throughout the greater Bay Area, Oakland, San Francisco, Marin County, Vallejo, and El Mundo, the Spanish language offering. Mm -hmm. uh, on his passing, uh, his widow, uh, Velda Berkeley, uh, purchased the paper, and then subsequent to that, uh, the post was purchased by Dr. Paul Cobb and his wife, Mrs. Gay Player Cobb. Mm -hmm. So I think they're going into their 15th year now of ownership. Uh, Paul just celebrated uh, uh, the 58th anniversary of the walk on the Pettus Bridge, where he was with Dr. Oh, Martin Luther King. yes, of course, in the and Pettus President, Bridge. President Joe Biden was right. down there uh, just this past week, uh, and that picture with President Biden on the front page of the, uh, is on the front page of the Oakland Post. Excellent, so excellent. This is Paul's. 50th anniversary with that, with that march with he and Dr. Martin Luther King. Excellent, wonderful. So I've been privileged to work with uh, Mr. Cobb, Dr. Cobb, and uh, Ms. Ms. Cobb in the post, and uh, with Mr. Berkeley when he was alive. Uh, on my many travels around the world, I represent the post uh, in China and Asia and uh, in Europe and South America. And uh, uh, during our heyday, <clears throat> we had a Washington D.C. Uh, office and the White House press credential and the Capitol Hill press credential and the Pentagon press credential, and that was by our wow. agent, the late Samuel Dennis. Okay. So I have a long-term relationship with him, and I've been a member of the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. for over 
over two decades. Excellent. So there is a you you make the statement that you're uh, Nancy Pelosi's favorite Republican. Yes. And I I'm gathering now that it partly because you were so involved with uh, the, the Washington press office and everything you have a pretty good relationship. Yes. Is that how it yes. came about? Well, that goes back to the late Congressman Belton's. Uh, when he first ran for Congress, uh, being a member of the Berkeley City Council, I was one of his first supporters as a military officer and as a Republican. Mm. And that stayed with him uh, through all that time. Uh, on the occasion of my retirement, he published a nice insert in the congressional record as a tribute to my 30 years of combined active and reserve duties. So we're very appreciative of that. We're very privileged to see the federal building that bears his name uh, down at 1301 Play Street. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we're very proud because Congressman Dellums started his career as a Marine Corps private. <clears throat> and when he reported his first installation, he was turned away because the commanding officer said, we don't want any of you people here. Mm. So it was not unusual. So he had a meteor rise in his service as a member of Congress from Marine Corps private to chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. Wow, okay. So he was very supportive. Uh, his committee provided funding to double the size of our reserve headquarters building at Travis Air Force Base, and he provided all the funding for the David Grant Hospital, mm -hmm. replacement hospital that's just at the, at the edge of the Travis Air Force Base. Yes. So his committee, the House Armed Services Committee, provided funding for those two major things that were, were near and dear to me at Travis Air Force Base. Right. Okay. So how did you um, get to know Nancy Pelosi then over that, those period, that period of time? I don't remember when we first met, but I've uh, supported her for her time in Congress, uh, uh, supported her for her campaigns and candidacies over the many, many years, and mm -hmm. we've had many occasions for meeting uh, at our various fundraisers and at various points. The uh, most recent my time with her was at uh, the foot of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, when she and uh, Transportation Secretary Poot Pete Buttigieg uh, brought a $400 million infrastructure grant uh, to yes. retrofit the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm -hmm. So that was... Uh, Mid-January this year. Mid-January, yes. And uh, there was a very nice time. Uh, Rudy Gonzalez, who's the Secretary of Treasurer of the San Francisco uh, Building and Construction Trades Council, uh, yeah. was there representing the unions, and he said that, that $400 million was going to serve uh, generations to come. Mm -hmm. So it was a nice time, and uh, had a nice uh, meeting with uh, Secretary Buttigieg, mm -hmm. and invited him to speak at the Commonwealth Club, where I've been a member for 40 years. Yes. And uh, also invited him to come and uh, share with us uh, Sail GP, which is an international yachting regatta we have here in, in, in San Francisco, May 6th and 7th of this year. Excellent. That's excellent. And you mentioned the Commonwealth Club. That's another uh, <laughs> date we had, I yes. guess I'll say. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I was, actually, this is what happened, because I was trying to arrange this interview with you, and I was on my way down to the Commonwealth Club to see um, uh, Danny Glover and Gus Townsend, who was the former mayor of, of uh, Berkeley. Newport. Newport, yes. sorry. And um, so I'm calling you, and finally I caught up to you, and I, I said, oh, I would really like to interview, et cetera, et cetera, and I was explaining that. And then finally I said, okay, I have to go because I have to go to this thing uh, with Danny Glover. And, I, and you said, well, I'm right across the street. I'm parked across the street. I'm going there tonight, so are you my date? <laughs> I'm glad you didn't stand me up. So that, so we, we, we went in together to that, which was a lot of fun. And I, um, with the history of, uh, first of all, the Commonwealth Club is, a, is an amazing institution. And I, you know, you've been a member for 40 years. Yes. Uh, and you know, I've maybe been a member on and off for about 15 years or so, yeah. but um, I think it's an amazing place to bring people like that mm -hmm. together who we, you know, I didn't know anything about uh, Gus at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know there had been a black mayor of Berkeley <laughs> all those years, so that was really remarkable. Um, and uh, so I was happy to see that you're, you're, you support that. It was a very nice evening. Very and, uh, nice evening. Uh, Gus, mayor, Gus Newport, former mayor of Berkeley, and uh, Danny Glover 
tell some very revealing stories about their backgrounds and about their experiences. Nothing new, but it's just nice to have that and to have that revealed in that forum. The Commonwealth mm -hmm. Club is the oldest and largest public speaking forum in the country, in the 120 country. years old, and uh, That's right. that program will be broadcast nationally on the radio. So right. It will be right. to a much larger audience. So it was a very nice and very warm reception that the club gave them. Yes, uh, and it may not have been anything new for you, but it was new for me. And, mm -hmm. and as long as I've lived in the Bay Area, I didn't know that. So history always needs to be told to the next generations, and that's what the Commonwealth Club is really great at. Uh, so now I want to uh, pivot to uh, talk a little bit about China because, you know, we were together at the Chinese yes. consulate. So first of all, I think you've been to China 12 times. Yes. And so how did that start? And, uh, and where do you see the future of the relationship between San Francisco and China uh, going? The most significant uh, first visit to China was on my honeymoon with my wife. If, uh, that was uh, in 1982, wow. and we've had numerous visits since that time. Uh, we saw the Three Gorges Dam uh, through its very process of being built, uh, and I was there the day of the final pour. Yeah. Uh, just a beautiful and rich history. Yeah. But uh, to fast forward to our time with the Council General, uh, he made it very clear and echoed by former San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown who indicated he'd been to China five times, that all the barriers to entry in China are, are down. It's free entry, no restrictions, uh, uh, no inhibitions caused by COVID. And he, he made a plea, an impassioned plea, uh, to the city and county of San Francisco and, and to the greater Bay Area to revisit China. Mm -hmm. And I think that was echoed in Mayor Brown's remarks uh, he reflected on the fact that his five visits to China, uh, he'd always been uh, warmly received and had great times, and he'd look forward to revisiting uh, that time. And uh, Council General was very gracious. I was with Council General the week before at the Bay Area Council, and uh, to that audience, he said the same thing. That uh, he said it was important that our two great nations. The People's Republic of China and the United States of America set the example in terms of world leadership and come together in the spirit of unity. And in the spirit of the rabbit, this is the year of the rabbit. Mm -hmm. So that year represents unity and harmony and prosperity. Mm -hmm. And he said in the spirit of the rabbit this year, in Chinese New Year, he was hoping and, and making a plea and making a call that our two countries would come together and set the example for how things can be working together yeah, like this to set the, an example for the world. Yes. And to be at peace and to prosper. Yes. So Council General said that at the Bay Area Council level with the Klamath the week before mm -hmm. in a New Year's celebration, and uh, he echoed that at the Chinese Council uh, when you and I were together there. Absolutely. And I think San Francisco is in a unique position in mm -hmm. terms of the relationship uh, with China, because we have the largest Chinatown outside of China, right? And uh, so we, and a lot of people visit here because of Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And the mayor, Mayor Breed, has been building the relationships uh, with the Chinese. So um, uh, oh, just over the last few weeks, I've been to a number of events that were specifically with the black community and the Chinese community. Mm -hmm. So she took, uh, there was a photo op at City Hall uh, in the rotunda mm -hmm. with all of the, the uh, API, Asian Pacific Islander mm -hmm. commissioners and all of the black commissioners. Mm -hmm. So there were about 65 people there. And uh, it was interesting how many of us know each other from different, you know, uh, parts of, of our, our time uh, in San Francisco, our work and our families. Uh, so it was kind of like old home week. And then a few weeks later, we had a joint um, Black History Month Lunar New Year celebration at the main library. It was called mm -hmm. Drum Beats and Heartbeats. And it was a celebration of the culture. So you had Chinese people doing hip hop. And, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was, just, it was amazing. Um, and there has been a, a real outreach to bring the communities together. Mm -hmm. So I think it was very telling that Willie Brown, former Mayor Willie Brown, was saying, we need to you know, re-engage with yes. China, right? The, the symbolism of that and the sincerity of what he was saying. I think this is a 
moment in time when uh, we need to do that. So, and I have not been to China, I have to say. So I'm looking forward. I don't. I've been as close you as should, Hong you Kong. Should, you should join that delegation. All around it, and <laughs> so I'm, I'll be there. I, I hope so. Well, um, so look, I want to just close it down, and I, I think um, I'm thinking about something you said to me about legacy, and. Um, and I think that's important for everyone to think about. You, you have something you want to say? No, I'm listening. No? You're listening. Yes. Okay, good. And I wanted just to ask you, what do you see as, as your legacy? What, what do you want people to take from your life as a legacy? I think the most important thing that I try and share with people that I meet is to encourage them to get to know themselves, to shut out all the noise and all the clamor and all the distractions and just look inward and find out who they are, what their values are, what they care about, to love self. And I, I attribute that to my family upbringing, my mother and father, my aunts and uncles, uh, the people I was in school with, the people I went to church with. Being colored in, in white America never inhibited me. Being colored in, in white America was never an inhibitor for me. I always knew who I was. And I also knew where I stood when I stepped outside in the great expanse of this country or any of the places in the world. It didn't matter whether Conway was in, in Paris, France, at the Air and Space 200th anniversary with the Monk, celebrating the Monk, or the Brothers, or in, in South America, or in Greenland or Iceland. I always valued who I was as a person. I always valued the teachings of my family, the teachings of the black community. You mentioned mm -hmm. the, the Paul Lawrence Dunbars of the world. Mm -hmm. Eliza, Eliza, bless the Lord, don't you know the days are broad, you know? <laughs> they let all the shining up while you sleep, where it's a sin. So when I, when, I, when I go out, I try and challenge the, the people I meet to look inside themselves and find out who they are and to value that. And to know that the value of who they are is all that counts. Mm. Who you are as a person is all that matters, because that's all you've got. That's right. I love the other thing I wanted to add to that beautiful um, uh, uh, description of your legacy uh, from the time that I've spent with you is that, uh, number one, I'll say my show is called On Point. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just talking about what that means. On Point has so many different meanings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I will say that you are really on point in terms of how you live your life, um, uh, because living your life in a way that uh, models for the next generation, how you can, it gives them the option. It gives us all the option. You know, you're a little older than me, mm -hmm. so I can say this, uh, I feel validated by seeing you living <laughs> your life the way you live it. And the thing I wanna add to that is you have fun <laughs> and I, I think it's so important, you know, there's so many things going on all the time uh, that you have to have fun and you have to see the humor in situations. And uh, I just can't stop laughing when I'm around <laughs> you and your references are uh, fascinating to me. So I really appreciate that about you. So uh, I hope that when I go to China, I won't just be sending you a postcard. Uh, we'll be together, you know, nice you and your wife and my husband, maybe, but, mm -hmm. you know, at least the two of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know what trouble we might get into. It'll be good trouble, as John Lewis says. John Lewis, yes. And uh, so thank you for spending time with us.